If 2020 taught us anything, is that we need to be prepared. Today I want to continue that conversation. I want to show you how I canned venison, dip my own beeswax candles, and I want to show you my new bug out bag. But first, I want to talk about internet security, something I'm taking a lot more seriously this year. As a YouTuber and an entrepreneur, I spend a ton of time online. And this year I decided I was going to ramp up my internet security. Now most internet users aren't even aware of the amount of surveillance and limitation and data mining done with their personal information on a daily basis. So I've decided to use a virtual private network called Surfshark. Surfshark is really super easy to use, just a click of a button, and it turns me into an anonymous, hard to trace online user and makes the internet a safer and more enjoyable place to be. I use it every day. It automatically starts up whenever I open up my computer and whenever I need it, I activate it with just one click. And now also when I travel, I don't have to worry about public Wi-Fi and my passwords and my videos and my data getting breached by a hacker. You know, I'm always sitting around looking around in a coffee shop going, who's out there trying to get into my computer? I don't have to worry about that anymore. So if you want both protection and freedom online, click the link below, use the promo code girl in the woods and you're gonna get 83% off the regular price and also three months of service totally for free. And Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee so there's no risk. Go ahead and hit up the link below to check it out. Canning is really easy. A lot of people think it's really quite hard, but it's not. It's super easy and you can pretty much can anything. And I really, really love canned venison. You have to use a pressure canner when you can meat. Today I'm gonna to be using my grandmother's pressure canner. I don't know how old this is. This is an all-American. It's really old. And when she gave it to me, I had the dial tested. It's really important if you pick up a used pressure canner, you need to take it somewhere and get the dial tested. Come to find out, my dial was reading about five pounds low. Now, depending on your elevation, you're going to want to find out what you need to can your venison at. Here, where I'm at in Michigan, I'm at a thousand feet or less. And so, I need to can my venison at 11 pounds of pressure. But because I already know in advance that my dial is five pounds low, I'm gonna to have to take my dial to 16 pounds of pressure when I can. It's really important to know where your dial's at or get a replacement dial. Now this is the lid. I'll show you how this comes together. In order to prepare your canner, you wanna add two to three inches of water in the bottom and get that heated up to be ready to accept your canning jars. Looks like I got a helper. Hello, Edna. Yeah, it's a good girl. Next step now is for me to get my prepared meat into the jars and get them in the canner. Now I prepared this deer several months ago. I cut it up and cut it into little chunks, knowing at the time I didn't have time to can it. So I put it in the freezer in these bags and I also used a big Ziploc gallon bags and froze it until a day like today, a nice snowy day when I can uh, warm up the house with a little bit of canning. So all I'm doing is putting the, the stew pieces, basically, they were cut into like stew sized pieces. Put that into my pot and just kind of gently cook it with some water. So my meat here is called a hot pack version of canning. It's gonna come right into the jars with this liquid and the meat. I'm gonna add some salt, we'll be good to go. So for canning, you're gonna need some very extremely clean canning jars. You can either wash them by hand or run them through your dishwasher. You're gonna need some lids, bands, and you're going to need a couple of tools. This is a magnetic lid lifter. And this little grabber guy, you're gonna need this to move your jars around because they're gonna be hot. Now for the lids, I add water and put them in this saucepan. I'm gonna gently heat this up so these lids are going to be ready to grab with my lid lifter and put on my cans, just like that. Oh, and you're also gonna need some type of a little funnel that sits on top of your jars so you can fill your jars. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a teaspoon of salt to all of my quart jars. And I like to use the wide mouth quart jars for canning venison. They just uh, are a little easier with the meat and I just always save them for my venison every year. Look at this, she gone. This little pot holder was made for me by Autumn. Now her parents have the channel nine to five to life off grid and we visited them a few weeks ago and she made me this pot holder. So thank you Autumn, I'm gonna use it right now. Here is 
my hot pack meat. You want to leave about one inch of head space in each jar, so don't fill it quite to the top. Now, if you were to just eat this venison I have in this pot right now, it would be quite tough. Once I can this, it is gonna fall apart and be like butter. Oh, canned venison is absolutely my favorite. It's good in all kinds of soups. I love it with the thick German noodles. Oh, it's delicious. Once you've had canned venison, you, you probably won't even want to uh, process your venison any other way, except for tenderloin and backstrap. I pretty much like to can the entire deer. That's how much I love canned venison. Doing stuff yourself is definitely rewarding, especially if you've hunted the animal, you've processed the animal, and now you're actually turning it into like the best food for your family. Really, really satisfying. Now some people uh, like to add things like peppers or garlic or something, but I just prefer to leave it just with salt and the venison because then you can always add that stuff while you're cooking the dish that you're making with the canned venison. So I just like to keep it real simple, just the venison, just the salt, and the broth water that goes with it. Next thing that's really important to do is take a cloth and wipe off the top of the jars. You don't want anything on the top and the rim of these jars because you want a really good seal with your lid. Now you can see how these lids are nice and hot and I just grab them, put the lids on each jar. Heating them up like that also sterilizes them nicely. Now the bands go on and you just want to go hand tight with the with the, the bands. These are ready to go in the canner. Okay, I'm just gonna set those in there. If they're too hot, you can use your jar lifter. All right, there are my six jars. You can see where the water level is. Now I'm gonna put the lid on and get the pressure building. You're gonna want it good and tight. This is actually what holds in the steam. So I'm gonna push that down and that will start to build pressure in this canner. And now I watch my dial come up and I don't start counting the time till my pressure is where it needs to be. What's really important is you keep an eye on your gauge. If it starts to creep up, you gotta really watch that heat. You've gotta keep it steady. You don't wanna getting it too high. You don't wanna dropping. So you really gotta pay attention to your gauge and make sure your pressure stays good. All right, we've hit our mark. So I'm gonna start the timer for 90 minutes. Good to go. All right, now that I've got my venison in the canner, I wanna show you guys how to make hand-dipped beeswax candles. Now this is something I've had lots of requests to show you how I do mine. And so here we go. It's really, really simple. First thing you're gonna need is good quality beeswax. Now I use uh, beeswax that I get off of Etsy. There's plenty to choose from. I buy it in one pound blocks. Here's what mine looks like. I could use a hammer or a mallet or something and crush this up. I tend to just drop them in and let them melt. Now the thing to remember is you're going to need a lot of wax to get started because you've got to have a tall container big enough that you can dip long, probably seven to eight inch candles. So that's something to keep in mind. What I have here is just a number 10 can. You can find them from any restaurant or a school. Somebody will have a ton of these kind of cans or maybe you have them at home. And this container here is just a tin that I found at a thrift store. Basically you want a double boiler setup. So you want a nice tall container for your wax that is leak proof. And then you want what I use is a number 10 can. Now, however you configure this is up to you, but you need a double boiler. This is surrounded by water. You definitely don't want to melt your wax directly on the burner. You want a double boiler. So get yourself set up. However tall of candles you want is gonna determine how big of a container you get. Now you can see I've got this pretty much filled up to the top. As I go, it'll get lower and I will drop in a new one pound of wax and bring that level back up so I can dip my candles. Now, although I have this on the burner right now, I'm going to turn this off because it's important that you don't have your wax too, too hot while you're dipping because you'll just dip the fresh wax right off. And I also use a container of cold water in between each dip. So for that, I just use whatever I have on hand and that happens to be a plastic pitcher. 
and that looks good. Now the size of wick that you choose depends on how thick of a candle you're going to make. Now for dipped tapers like we're gonna make, I recommend candle wick that is one aught. You want uh, a thickness of wick that is going to allow your candle to burn efficiently. And the nice thing about beeswax is if you get it all right, which isn't too hard, it'll burn without dripping and it'll burn really slow. And it smells so good. It's definitely why I prefer beeswax candles. So you wanna cut a length that you think you're gonna wanna dip. The first thing you do is just dip in the wick. You just want a light coat of wax on it. Now to cool it down quick, we dip it into the water. And I'm just gonna use my hands and straighten out the wick. And after a couple dips, we'll have a good start. So you wanna do a quick dip in. You don't wanna linger in the hot wax. And you wanna put it right over into the cold water to cool it down. That'll help you build up the candle faster and it's way better to do it with a cold dip in between each dip of wax. So quick dip in, shake it off, and a dip in the cold water. Now as I go, I shape my candles. The, they'll sometimes start to be a little wavy, so I just by hand and by eye straighten my candles. Once you get to this phase, it starts to get easier because they're nice and stiff. You shake it off, dip it in the cold water, dip in cold water. But it's pretty simple, just the dip here, a dip there. Once in a while I find that if there is a water droplet on the wax, it'll kind of leave what looks like a bubble in the wax. It's just, it's not gonna affect the candle, but it, it won't look as pretty, so. Keep an eye on that. I also turn these upside down and dip it in the cold water to make sure I get the top half. Just use a paper towel to dry off the wick between. You can see I'm starting to get these little knobs on the bottom, so I pinch these off, put the wax back in there, and then I just shape these back by hand into nice round bottoms. So that's how I keep the bottoms from getting a teardrop shape as well. You can see this one's this one's getting a little crooked so I'm just gonna lightly bend it back into shape. You're gonna keep doing this until you get to the size you like. That's good right there. Now I'm just gonna pinch off the bottom. Now I'm gonna take these over to the counter, and give them a nice flat bottom. What I do is just gently press down vertically and it gives it, and it gives them a nice flat bottom. I did three out of that batch of wax. And now my wax is getting lower, so I'm gonna wanna add more wax. So you can see after three dippings, uh, the wax has is, is dropped quite a bit in my container and it's starting to cool down. So I'm gonna throw the burner on, on low again. And then I'm going to add another pound of wax to bring up the level. Just gently drop it in. Let that melt and I'll keep going. And these candles are about four ounces each. Uh, they're about seven to eight inches long. And these are gonna burn six to seven hours each. It's beautiful. Just smell those candles. They smell so good. Love beeswax candles. Hey guys. The canning process is done, but we're not quite ready to open this thing up yet. So I'm gonna turn the heat off. And what I'm gonna do now is just completely let this thing go back down to zero. You don't want to open it up right now. So we're just going to let it sit, let the pressure drop, and then we'll open it up. All right, guys, we have reached zero on my dial. Totally depressurized now so I can safely open this up. Oh, if I can get it open. There we go. There's what they look like before I take them out. Everything looks good. You take your little lifters 
And now I'm gonna put it on the counter. They can just sit here while they cool. And I've already heard two of these seal. Heard the pop. She got her popcorn. She likes your popcorn. Yeah. Edna, everybody's here waiting for the venison to be done. That's what it looks like. Beautiful. Now what I'm gonna wanna do, is wait till these all cool. You want to store them with the bands off. Now I live at a place where I don't necessarily have a, a super dry basement all the time. There's lots of humidity. You're gonna wanna take those bands off so they don't rust down into the can. It makes it hard to get off. So take the bands off. You wanna label what it is and what the date is and you're good to go. That is some good eats right there. Canned venison is the bomb. I'm gonna be at this for a few days. I've got a lot of bags of venison to do, but um, that's how you do it, super simple. Look at this guy. He's loving life. <laughs> Hello, Hobie. He's a big dude, he's just chilling out. Fires, storms, ice, power outages, getting stuck in your vehicle, and no cell coverage. I really don't think you should underestimate your need to be prepared. Start thinking about worst case scenario and start preparing you and your family for whatever emergency or situation may come your way. All right guys, here's my pack. This is the new Survivewear survival bag. Now this is a 72 hour bag that will support two people for 72 hours. Now Survivewear is my number one pick for first aid kits. They have the most professional, the most organized kits I've seen on the market. So I'm a big fan of their products. I was really excited to hear that they were doing a survival bag, so they sent me one to check it out. First thing you notice is it's just a nice sturdy bag. It's waterproof, has lots of pockets and places to put your own gear. It's actually a backpack. It's got a nice padded back and a padded belt, totally adjustable and back here, is a slot for you know your own personal gear and your laptop which I really like and another pocket for personal documents so as far as a get out and go bag it's got room for your own stuff too first off up top is the first aid kit the thing about survive wear first aid kits all of them are extremely well organized everything is labeled so there's no question when you need to grab something where it's at big fan of their first aid kits now some people tune out when you talk about bugging out. What bugging out really means is that you're in a situation where you need to leave home. Either your life is threatened, your family's threatened, uh, maybe a fire is moving through. You can't stay home because staying home is the best place to be. Being prepared at home is the number one thing, but if you can't, you need to have a bag where you can just grab and go. It's gonna provide you with some basic needs and supplies so that you can get to safety. First off, this is exactly as I got it, and it comes with a emergency plan book you can fill out. Now it's got three compartments for two people. One is the food, one is the personal gear, and they actually have water in this kit. But before we get to that, let me show you what's in this bag. Emergency two-person tent. We've got a splint. We've got some glow sticks. Here is a knife locking nice and sharp it's got a uh, another blade here for ripping it's got a clip not bad okay some duct tape always handy matches in their own case 20 stormproof matches and striker life straw you can drink right out of the uh, water source with this life straw and it's going to filter it out here's some paracord of course, you're gonna always need paracord. Love this that they put in zip ties. Zip ties are just awesome. This radio here, I'm quite impressed with. This is a crankable radio with a light and a USB port. So you can charge up your phone, how this works. Works by solar or you can crank it. Here's the light, nice bright LED light. Check this out. It's got AM, FM. A lot of people believe it. I'm one of them. It's got to bring everybody together. And USB ports. Crank it to make it work or put it in the sun. Love, love, love this little radio. It's got a battery indicator 
years. So these bags are good for two people. The uh, emergency food rations. Now I've actually tried these and they're really actually really good. These are a very dense um, calorie rich product so very little goes a long ways. Each person has three rations, two per day of those. These are your personal items. Now what you have in here are um, a pair of goggles. Now these are going to help you navigate something when it's like really dusty or dirty and you just need to get out like the World Trade Center's coming down. These would have been perfect. You have biodegradable wet wipes. This is a whistle, <coughs> compass and thermometer, whistle, and another little light with this little whistle. Here's a few tampons that you could use for either women's hygiene or starting a fire. An emergency sleeping bag. These are two N95 masks. Also in here are a couple of biohazard bags and an emergency poncho. Last thing we have in here is water. So let me show you what that looks like. These are literally just packets of water in plastic pouches. So individually wrapped. A little bit of water will go a long ways when you don't have any. There's enough room in here to throw, you know, a couple clothing items. I would definitely have, you know, a water bottle over here. You know, you there's just, just enough room to grab and go. I'm super impressed by this pack. So for me, the only thing I would like to see added to this pack would be some kind of a metal container or cup so you could heat up something on the on a fire, directly on a flame. The other thing I would add would be some kind of tinder, little tinder packet, tinder bundle, so that I could start fires really easy. Throw it in one of these pockets, throw it inside, and be good to go. But guys, I can't recommend this enough. You know, we own property in Alaska and remote parts of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and there are so many places where having a kit like this in your vehicle would be a great idea. Like throwing this in your trunk, uh, the back door of your house, someplace really convenient. You gotta have it where you need it. And a kit like this is going to get you down the road and, and keep you alive with some basic, basic necessities. So guys, if you want to check this out, I'll put the link below. And also they're offering a 10% discount. Use my discount code below. So thanks so much to Survivewear. Feels so good knowing you can be prepared and take care of yourself in the event of an emergency. Well guys, hope you liked the video. See you in the next one. This is Girl in the Woods. She gone. Oh, don't forget to get outside, get happy.